invite on stage the first female, first Asian, youngest ever CHRO of Unilever, who's responsible for Unilever's business and financial performance. Ladies and gentlemen, no prizes for guessing this one. Please put your hands together for Lena Nile as she's going to help us time travel into the future of work and how to be more human in a digital world. Welcome, nice to see you. Xenia. Hello everyone. Listen, I must tell you, it's been a long day. I need lots of audience energy. Okay, I need lots of applause. Lots of whistles are welcome at my age. <laughs> good man, good man. He's a good man. Yeah, and lots of head nodding, waving, whatever. But I really need audience engagement. Are you ready for that? It is such a joy and honor to be here today. Huh? Nothing gives me more energy than talking to HR people, talking to business leaders who care about HR, about how we can, and I really believe, we can change the world. So nothing gives me greater joy. So I'm excited, delighted, honored to be here. So to if you go away from here, remembering two key messages, I'll be really happy. Of course, I'll share plenty of examples, and some of that might be good for you, not good for you. But I want you to think of two big themes when you think of this session. And that's the two big messages I want to take away with you. One is that as the world is getting more connected, and the joys of connectivity are fantastic. As the world is getting more connected, we are getting disconnected as humans. That's the first message. And the second message is we as leaders have to, have to digitize for sure, but we have to digitize while making our companies, our institutions, more human. And the more digital you become, the more human you need to be. Straightforward two messages. You'll remember it. How many of you agree with these two messages already? There, my, my speech is done. I'll take some rest now. <laughs> so, you know, I was uh, reflecting on how connected our world has got. To us, as soon as I landed in Delhi, I had a picture from my son who was eating momos in Leh. I had a little video from the nurse who's supporting my father who's been in hospital and did a few steps on his walker today. I had, you know, lots of you on Twitter, LinkedIn interact with me. Can I see some hands of those who've been Fantastic. I love you all. Keep it coming. Lots of messages. As you can see, I love applause, love compliments, love getting a lot of love. So go for it. So, and I was just reflecting on how technology has indeed connected us in ways we couldn't imagine. Now, I grew up in Kolhapur, fairly small place, eight hours away from Mumbai. I could not have imagined how easily I could live in London, being connected to everything that's happening in my life, in my family back home. So the joys of connectivity are fantastic, and I can give you staggering numbers. You know, the internet usage has moved up from 24% of the world to 51% of the world in the last 10 years. India now has 12% users in the of the internet. 12% of the users are all from India. I mean, I can give you staggering statistics to say how this connectivity is helping us make our lives better. Whether it's farmers who are relying on it for the data they need, whether it's our, our salespeople selling to consumers in a more precision way, there's so many examples, and I'm sure you could do the same with me. And that's fantastic, and we must embrace it, not resist it, and love it. But we must equally be mindful that it's leading to some lost connections. It's leading to some disconnections. The anxiety statistics in US went up by 40% this year. 
trust in politics, in business, in employers is the lowest we've seen since the trust survey was done by Edelman for the last 10 years. You've heard all of the stuff. You can have 450 friends on Facebook, but nobody to call your own friend. You can... 19 to 32 year olds are today the most socially isolated they've ever been, says University of Pittsburgh researcher last week. Stress in the workplace is real. In fact, I'm going to do a test now. Burnout for the first time, by the way, is recognized as a workplace crisis by occupational health and safety. It's now a real crisis. So all the joys of technology, which was supposed to make our life better, and it is making our life better, our businesses better, and in service of the consumers and planet better, fantastic. But it also has a human price we are paying. Okay. So I'm going to do a test. How many of you know at least one friend or one family member, or you yourself, suffering from either stress, anxiety, panic attacks, depression, any form of mental well-being. Can I see a show of hands? Me included. That's our world. So, as we get more connected, we have to remember we are getting more disconnected as humans. And that's the context in which I want you to remember when we digitize HR, we use the power of technology, how we can dial up the human. So far, so good. You're convinced? You agree? Anybody wildly disagreeing? I love debates. All agree? So, we've been on a journey of digitization. You know, I've cons been consistent in saying we've got to digitize the shit out of HR. Yeah, everything can be digitized. We have to question ourselves, why not? Okay. So, let me give you a few examples. For example, recruitment. Our recruitment process is digitized, end to end. A young person finds 10 seconds to upload their CV from LinkedIn, then they play some games with biometrics, then they go and get interview, have a selfie video that helps us analyze through machine learning algorithms, and we finally get 3,000 people who we interview and we select 800 people out of. You know, I love that we digitized it. Why? Because to me it's more human. To, we have 1.8 million people who apply to us every year. Even if I throw hundreds of people in recruitment, we can never do justice to the number of people who, who apply. And getting a message saying, thank you very much for applying to Unilever, we'll get back to you, is that a very human message? I don't think so. So technology gives us the power to scale and give an experience to every person who's interested in, in us, which is fantastic. Everybody gets to play the game. Everybody goes in through a video session. Everybody gets an analysis of how they've done. Everybody gets a personalized report of what they did well or didn't do well. So, this, so it's big technology, it's possible to handle that scale, and it is possible to give a reasonable experience to everyone who wants to join your company. So I'm a big fan of digitizing it, because I feel it makes us more human. Let me give you a few more examples. One is we've partnered with Degreed in Learning, so it provides a curation of everything that's available externally, everything that's available internally, and you get a daily feed of what you should learn based on your strengths, your development areas, what you're passionate about, and based on how you learn. I like videos, somebody else likes reading an article. Bite-sized stuff. Each of us is different in the way we learn, in the way we absorb, in the way we assimilate information, assimilate knowledge. So, this platform allows us to create a personalized daily learning feed to every person. I get enormous data. By the way, I get enormous data from the two million people who apply to Unilever every year. I can tell you the correlation between what kind of people will succeed in Unilever and won't, all of that. But this gives us so much you know, data on active learners. How are the people who are active learners showing up in performance rating terms? How are they delivering in the business? So you can correlate so many things with the data that you get and make it more meaningful, more customized, more personalized for everyone. Of course it feels human if I get a daily feed that talks to me and gives me content I would love to devote. We've also experimented with bots. Una bot is our HR bot. The, my most popular question is, is Una a boy or a girl? I don't know. Una is a bot and is a very nice bot and doesn't matter what the gender is. So Una is our first port of call for everyone in partnership with Microsoft 
that's the integrated platform that we want everyone to go to to get some of the simple queries sorted. You know, we used to have um, 250 people in call centers taking HR calls. There used to be a million calls coming every year. A fourth of those calls were, hello, is this HR help desk or IT help desk? Sorry, it's IT help desk or HR help desk, you know? Calls that added no value to anybody. And we've taken away the whole thing. No call centers, no calls. There's Una bot. You can find answers to your simple query. What is conveyance, allowance, and Delhi, or whatever it is. Simple questions without having to run around to find an HR person. Feels much easier, effortless. The key of any human experience is effortlessness. How easy is it for me to find information? How easy is it for me to learn? How easy is it for me to get the things that will make my life and my impact better? We've also experimented with a ton of crowdsourcing tools. So if you come to my office in London, and all of you are very welcome to come, you will see two big screens where in real time we have employee listening tools. I get to hear what's happening in all countries. Basically, I love gadgets and gimmicks, so it's very nice to have it in my room. And you can listen to employee voice in real time. What is the sentiment in China versus Taiwan, et cetera, et cetera. You can get it in real time. You can see how some of the internal decisions, communication, is impacting employee morale in real time. Again, a very important uh, data point to take immediate action and intervene when there are issues, not wait for once a year, once in two years, when you listen to all employees at the same time. So there are plenty of crowdsourcing tools. But one of the big things we've done, even as we've digitized HR, Almost entirely. I don't think there's any aspect of HR. And I forgot to talk about what Josh referred to. Josh, keep, keep being a good advocate for us. I love it. Um, is Flex Experiences, which is in partnership with a company called Gloat from Israel, where, you know, you can post anything. You can post experiences. And people who have any capacity, it doesn't need to be a full-time job. You think you have 10% capacity, you want to learn something about data analytics, great. Put your profile out there, say you're willing to look for 10 or 20% of your time in data analytics, and as such an opportunity comes up, you'll be matched, you'll get a reminder, you go and you do it. And we have unlocked something like 35,000 hours of work, we've unlocked 1,200 projects for different people. It's a huge success, 34,000 people are on the platform engaging every day about, do you have capacity, do you want to come and work for me? And people are learning new things, things that they can do on top of the existing job. Is this a cue for me to dance or something? which I'm very prepared to do. Bollywood dancing is one of my, you know, I always say I'm the best Bollywood dancer in Unilever. It's self-certified. Nobody's challenged me, so I can say the same thing today. I'm the best Bollywood dancer in all of HR. <laughs> so I thought maybe this is a cue for me. So one of the things, so how are we dialing up the human? That we are dialing up digitization, absolutely. And my one big piece of advice to you is just experiment. Don't worry how it will fit, what it will mean. Just go and experiment. There are fabulous tools, fabulous uh, AI platforms. Just experiment. Some of it will make sense for your company. You know, the second most tech behind which money is going is HR tech. We should feel good about that, okay? At least some things are in service of the profession we, we lead. But I would urge you to experiment. Try new things. Try technology that works, doesn't work. You will find a way for it to make sense for your company. But even as we do that, we are keeping a very clear focus on the human side of our agenda. Okay? The first piece in the human side of the agenda is purpose. I passionately believe, and I know I'm speaking for my colleagues when I say that we passionately believe that knowing your purpose, knowing what gets you out of bed, knowing what you're passionate about, gives you the anchor to be in a world where we are seeing unprecedented change. Every morning you get up with so many jobs are going, 75 million jobs are going because automation is coming, fourth industrial revolution is coming, skills are becoming useless. It's every day that we see unprecedented change. And we believe that purpose, knowing your purpose makes a huge difference. So 100% of our employees are going through purpose workshops, where they spend time looking at crucible moments, what shaped them, what childhood experiences shaped them, what has brought them to the workplace, what is that they want to achieve. 
It sounds like a fluffy thing when we said, oh, what? You want purpose workshops for everyone? What are you going to do? But today, more than 40,000 people have been through it. And the level of engagement in people who've been through that experience is much higher than all other employees. But what's important is we then connect the purpose and passion to everything else that you do. So when you're doing flex experiences, you're actually looking for experiences in the area that you're passionate about. When you're learning, you devour content more easily if it is something that you find your purpose and passion in. So purpose is at the heart of how we're trying to humanize the massive digitization journey we are on. The second thing we do is really invest in employee well-being. I really believe that if you're anxious, if you're not feeling good, there is no way you're going to feel ready to deal with the complex stuff of our time. Problems you've never faced before. Most of the things we're doing are new stuff. I didn't think when I started 25, 26 years ago that I'd be doing this in HR. I mean, I couldn't see it. On a lighter note, when I told my dad I wanted to do human resources after being an electronics engineer, he was so disappointed. He was like, how can you do HR? Nobody cares about HR. It's a back office function. Why would you do that? Anyways, it's been a long while. He's now changed his line. Now he says HR is a very good function. But, you know, it took 25 years. But the point I'm making is, if we have to tackle things like that, which we have never done before, things that are being thrown at us, which are new stuff, you've got to have a degree of physical, mental, emotional well-being. And we are investing in that in a big way. People have well-being plans, what are they going to do, sleep, nutrition, all sorts of things to help our employees, empower them to take care of their own well-being. If you'd asked me 10 years ago, would you do something like this? I would have said, why should we patronize people? People should take care of their own health. Why should we worry if people are getting exercise or sleep? It's not our problem. But my thinking has evolved over the last 10 years, saying, absolutely no. They're our greatest asset. They make the biggest difference to the company. Why would you not invest in the health and well-being of our people? A third thing we do is massive investments in learning. Now, if you're not learning 100 hours a year today, you're already falling behind. 100 hours. That's a good measure. It came out of nowhere, but 100 hours is a good measure. I like it. It's a round number. I like it. So 100 hours a year. You have to be investing that kind of time to learn. So we are really using every way to drive up learning agility in the way we assess people to recruit them, in the way we train people for leadership. Our standards of leadership has learning agility right in the middle of it. So really investing in learning agility. So for example, we are reconsidering so many of the things we did. You know, when you completed 15 years, you'd get a watch from the company for loyalty. Yeah? When you finished 25 years, you'd get a month's salary as a gold jewelry. We're challenging all that and saying, no, you'll get renewal days, you'll get time off. Five days, if you've completed five years. 20 years, go for 20 days. Paid off, paid time off, renewal. Go learn, learn something, travel, open your mind, come back. We want you refreshed. So we are really challenging ourselves to look at normal reward and recognition stuff and say, what is more relevant in the 21st century? And last but not the least, really investing in our leaders. Now, our standards of leadership is very simple. It has the inner game and the outer game. Inner game is all about a sense of purpose and service, learning agility, personal mastery, resilience, all of that. We're all going to fail a million times before we succeed in today's age. If you're scared of experiments, scared of piloting stuff, this is not the century for you. You really have to let go. Let go of assumptions, let go of norms, and experiment and try. And that means having personal mastery. That means having resilience. So the inner game in many ways, a sense of purpose, service, a sense of learning agility, is becoming even more important than an outer game of passion for high performance, business leadership, being a great talent catalyst. We believe that the inner game gives you that foundation to make a bigger impact on your outer game as leaders. So all of this together, focusing on the purpose, focusing on employee well-being, focusing on learning agility, and focusing on building everybody to be leaders. I'm always asked, who is a leader? A leader is no longer about seniority in a world that's going to be more networked and less hierarchical. In fact, I, I really don't like 
hierarchy. I get very mad if people come to my office and tell me, but you know, because I'm senior, I should have this and I should have a better table. And it just annoys me. If you want to see me annoyed, just do that. You will see me annoyed. So really challenging. We're investing in everybody's leadership development because everyone is leader. In a networked organization, you're leading peers. You're doing, you're having influence and impact. So it doesn't matter where your place in the hierarchy is, we all have significant influential leadership roles to play. So we're really investing in building leadership capability for all. Now you're thinking, Lena's saying invest so much in technology, look after all the people, put human at the heart of it, where the hell is all this money going to come from? Yeah? Now the, 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 the thing I feel the most joy about is that thankfully, Today, with all the investments we're doing in digital technology, we have the data to show that being more human actually has better business impact. I'll give you a few numbers. For every one dollar we invest in well-being, we get a return of two and a half dollars. Please note, I'm global citizen now, so I said dollar. I didn't say rupees. But for every dollar that you invest in well-being, you get two and a half dollars back. Yeah? That's the return. We can, I can show you data which shows skill gaps closing in a particular customer development function leading to better performance. You can link reduction of attrition to top line growth. You can link employee engagement in the way people feel to real business performance. So I'm so grateful that today we're living in a time where we can have the power of data and technology to tell the human story, to say it's worthwhile investing in people because here's, here's what happens. Your company gets more human. And if your company gets more human, you get business performance. And here's the evidence, here's the proof. So I would also urge you to make sure that you're sp that speaking the language of business performance, you're speaking the language of bringing the power of purposeful people, the power of people who are well, healthy, joyful, and bringing that power to show that that contributes to a better business and a better world. Because all of our jobs, we have massive impact even beyond the companies we lead. I mean, we're so privileged. I'm so privileged to have so many of you who talk to me, not just today, on subjects that are important to you. So it's great to have influence, but that influence has to be used to make our organization and institutions more human. And that humanity can be evidenced and proven today. I can give you a string of numbers, because I promise you, when I walk into the boardroom, I rarely say, you know, we should do a lot of learning because it's good for our people, we should take care of them. I go in with straight numbers saying, I invest 100, mil 100 million in reskilling, here's the output, here's the return, here's what we can do differently. So it's really important to do that. So one of the things we're doing as the future of work becomes clear is to put 100% of our workforce through purpose workshops and 100% of them through an upskill, reskill, or transition plan. Either you upskill yourself to the new jobs that are coming or reskill yourself to do something else or get ready to transition into a different set of employment models, different set of organizations. And in six of our countries, we're beginning to do this with other partners. So but as long as you put people at the heart of it, these creative solutions will come because you know we're all capable of fabulous creativity. So as long as we put our people at the heart of our agenda, we will come up with the creative solutions that will make the future of work more human, not the scary digital automation, robots, everybody going, human beings no longer valued, but to a story of more value for the human because some of the repetitive things are gone away. Some of the things that added less value are gone away. That's why we're getting the full humanity of a human being. If you have young children, please encourage them to hone their creativity, their intuition, their problem solving, because those are the skills that are more important. As Duff Seedman says, we're moving from hands to heads to hearts. We needed our hands pre-industrial revolution to make pots, to do whatever we needed to do. Then came first industrial revolution, machines did everything for us. And then we became our heads, knowledge, intelligence mattered. Now with machine learning, algorithms, all of that coming, our hearts are going to matter more. You know, there was a great experiment done 
with 900 cancer specialists using the power of Watson and other AI platforms. All 900 cancer specialists had access to the same data, the same algorithms, the same machine learning. There were few doctors, a handful, who were more successful than others at detecting and curing cancer. And it came down, the differentiation factor was that they had more empathy than the other doctors. They were able to tune in to stuff that was unsaid by the patients and diagnose it more correctly and more securely. So we are moving to an era of hearts. I really, really believe that. I do want to urge all of us to walk tall because this is a time, there's never been a time, not in my 26 years of being an HR professional, where there's been such a crying need for fantastic HR expertise. There's never been such a crying need. People want us to step up and help shape cultures, help make company more human, help raise productivity. They're big business problems that we are being asked to lead. Transformation. I mean, transformation is such a common word now. I stop using it because well, everybody's transforming everything all the time. When are you going to say, now next five years, we have chutti, no transformation. If there's somebody like that in the audience, tell me. I'll give you an, a flex experience to come and work with me. Because we're all so busy driving transformations constantly. So I passionately believe that this is the era for people in HR to step up and show what we're capable of. Yeah. My own purpose is to ignite the human spark to build a better business and a better world. I want to use every moment I have to ensure that human potential is valued everywhere, at business tables, at board tables, at government meetings, among professionals everywhere. That's what my purpose is. I really want to show the power of what human potential, human movements, human transformation is capable of doing. And this is the time that we can do it because we are supported by an environment that needs us. The biggest problems of our time, income inequality, climate change, all these problems need massive human intervention, massive human creativity and problem solving. And we can unleash that. So this is a time we should be walking with confidence, walking with a swagger. You know, we know the answers, we're going to get this done, we're going to humanize this place. And what technology and digitization does is provide us the wherewithal, provide us the wherewithal to do the stuff we need to do at scale and get that done in a personalized, customized, human way, but also gives us the space to do the things that truly matter, which is taking care of the human spirit and the human potential that's in our, that we have the privilege to serve. So, so, so that's really what I want to leave you with, that the world is getting connected at a pace that's crazy, but that connected world is le leading to disconnected humans. And in our HR leadership roles, we must lead for digitization. We must lead for bringing technology into everything we do. HR is waiting to be disrupted. So many of the things we do are pointless. Don't release human potential. They smother it, actually. So be much more challenging about taking away the stuff that smothers people. God knows what distribution curves, and I'll label you like this, and I'll f give you 15 rules before you can do anything in the company. Break all of that. Yeah, really think about what can I do to unleash this human spirit and potential. And that will give us the courage, the space to be more human and create a business and create a world that is much more human where the true value of a human being is nourished, is nurtured, and we unleash the potential of everyone who works in the workplace or beyond. Okay? So that's my passionate plea to you. Let's really make this whole technology revolution into a people and a human revolution. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for Lena and I. Come on, make some noise. Lena, thank you so much for talking to us straight from the heart. I'm going to check with my, okay.
We are. We really don't have time for a Q and A. Not uh, even one or two, no. no. Unfortunately, Lena, we've really run out of time. In fact, I was planning to, you know, for you to show us your favorite Bollywood hook step, but oh, it looks yeah. like that's. Can we make that happen in Absolutely, five seconds? but I have a condition. I need the audience to stand up and dance with me. <laughs> okay. What do you think was gonna? Are you Are you guys game for that? Are you game to stand up and dance? Go for okay, it! Come on! Up! Favorite hook step, Lena, in 10 seconds. Favorite step. <laughs> I need all of you to dance. Listen. At least, I know you're all packed in. But let's give it a go. Come on. Yes, okay. we literally have nine seconds on the clock. Josh, you Lena. can come back. I can show you a step. You can go back and write in your book. I learned about how to do Bollywood dancing. Okay, which one is it going My to be? My favorite line. When was the last Josh. time you did something for the first time in your life? That was the time you grew. Remember this. When was the last time you did something for the first time? Yes. Do we have music? Do we have do music? We have music, DJ? No. No, okay. let's just do it. Maybe. Let's just do it. Yeah. Okay, what do you... Okay, one of my favorite steps is this. Okay? The pelvic thrust. <laughs> Woo! Anyone knows how to whistle Bollywood style? Yeah, that is more like it, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Lena and I are once again. Lena, thank, thank you, you so much, much you for you. taking time out of your Sorry, very busy schedule. I apologize as well. Please.